Hello everyone. Good afternoon to one and all present here. I Riya Jain welcome you all to the second session of Foundations of Cloud Computing on behalf of Wall Story. What is Wall Story? Wall Story has been started with a vision to collaborate with various educational institutes and corporate houses to empower NGOs and individual volunteers who wish to bring positive change in the world. It is currently focusing on organizing workshops for skilling students, completing project of NGOs and awareness campaigns and various social issues. Let me introduce you to the speaker of the day, Mr. Roshan Kulkarni. He is the founder and CEO at Mindstick Software Labs, a technology evangelist and an entrepreneur at heart. Roshan has a master's degree in computer science from IIT Bombay. Sir brings over 15 plus years of leadership experience in product strategy, technology leadership, and management consulting. Mr. Roshan is passionate about nurturing nascent product ideas and accelerating them to the market. His primary areas of interest include software scalability, cloud engineering, and digital transformation across global enterprises. Now I request Mr. Roshan, sir, to carry forward the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ria. Uh, good evening uh, to all of you here in the session today. Um, as uh, many of you know, this is the second part of our Cloud Foundations uh, workshop. Um, continues to build on what we talked about uh, the last time, uh, but I'm hoping that we can go a little bit deeper. Um, the content we present today is gonna to be a little denser than what we've looked at so far. Uh, so I really hope uh, on this Sunday evening, you've come prepared with a, uh, with a cup of coffee uh, to keep you through it. Uh, I really appreciate also uh, the team at Wall Story for uh, providing, you know, establishing this amazing platform for students, for new college graduates, uh, for young professionals uh, to help them upskill uh, their competencies in this tech space and, and kind of define a great career path for themselves. So let's dive right in. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna build on what we covered in the last uh, session. And the, just a quick recap of things we talked about the last time. Uh, we talked about, uh, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the need of cloud computing, the, the why of cloud computing. Um, we also talked about aspects where we talked, you know, looked at aspects like uh, elasticity being such a core tenet of cloud computing, the ability to have on-demand resources. Um, we also looked at the ability to only pay for what you consume, uh, for example. Um, and this notion that there are, you know, failure is rather a norm in, in, in large scale systems and environments. Uh, we also moved on to uh, discuss aspects like different service models, um, the IaaS, PaaS, SaaS service models. Uh, we looked at notions like the private cloud and the public cloud. Uh, what happens when an enterprise wants to set up a private cloud? Um, we also touched upon a very interesting area, which was the idea of horizontal scaling, right? Being able to, uh, the ability for your application to take on more traffic uh, while using a lot of commodity infrastructure, uh, as opposed to the idea of vertical scaling, where you kind of take one compute uh, and keep um, sort of scaling that one un node or unit up. Um, also, uh, I think we wrapped up by looking at a quick assignment. I hope some of you have had a chance to uh, start to build it. Um, again, some of the AWS services like Lambda that we talked about are part of their free tier. So if you could create an account for yourself and start to hack away a real cloud project, um, you know, I certainly encourage uh, you to do that. So our conversation today uh, is going to be centered around two things. Uh, we will look at this idea of uh, what's a cloud native application architecture. And uh, this has been a term, a jargon that's been thrown around a lot uh, lately in the, in the industry and the market. 
uh different people mean different things sometimes when they use that term uh it would be good to double click on that it'd be good to understand what do we really mean by an application being cloud native so as you can see our previous conversation was mostly centered around infrastructure now we're moving the focus over to uh an application architecture kind of lens to this um as part of looking at this we'd also like to start uh building a real uh take a real world example and start to build a uh build out a architecture for uh, a cloud architecture for that real world example today and uh, i'm also joined by a couple of my colleagues who would help us with uh, uh, a demo in the middle of our uh, session today there's going to be a demo of um, a container tool a container platform called docker that we'll be looking at So let's start with what we want to build uh, in today's session. So you are an entrepreneur, and uh, you think that uh, you want to launch your own e-commerce portal. Uh, Flipkart has been doing well, so you feel that you could launch this platform called Flipstart.com. It's an online shopping portal, and you sit down and think through, you know, what could be the different features and requirements uh, that you want in this application. um at some point you want to take this up build this application and run it in a cloud environment so uh, through the rest of our session we would continue to build on this example as we go along um as you can see quite a few fun functional requirements right there some that come top of your mind uh, right you need users to sign up uh, accounts in your platform uh maybe you need a single sign on capability where uh, users could just do a login with facebook or login with google on your application um you it's an e-commerce application so it's going to have a product catalog it probably has a lot of product videos um that your your buyers users are going to play back um you have things like you know from the catalog you go to the cart from the cart you go to the checkout and then you have the ability to fulfill those orders and track the shipments on those orders right um like most projects where we you know focus so much on functional requirements that sometimes we are uh, we take a bunch of non functional requirements for granted uh, and these non functional requirements can play a big role in the success of your platform or the success of your product so let's quickly look at the non functional requirements uh, here you want your platform to be highly performant in nature uh, most of your users most of your buyers on the commerce platform will have little patience um you're going to lose them if your pages take too long to load and so on at the same time you're potentially expecting millions of users to come through so you need an ability to scale as well uh, you need to deliver performance but at scale your site can never ever go down right so you're looking at uh, a very strong requirement of high availability you probably are saying five nines right so 99.999% uptime or something like that uh, is expected uh, from your platform um at the same time you want to make sure that your infrastructure spend is optimized so you want to leverage this idea of elasticity that those times of the day or those days of the week when you have less traffic that you can give up the infrastructure back uh, you don't need to keep it with you and by by doing that you obviously optimize on the spend that uh, the infrastructure spend that your platform will have uh, as well um if that's not enough you also want to make sure your application has a strong security perimeter and um, you want to make sure that uh, the you know it's it's sort of self governing in some ways right it's automated it's self regulated in some ways so you don't have to stay up at 2 am in the night trying to fix things that are potentially broken uh you know so we'd also want to look at those aspects as we uh, build this use case today so by the end of the conversation i hope that we can arrive at a good architecture uh for a problem statement at hand uh, for this business uh objective at hand and uh, my goal is to start to use some of the aws components to uh, build the solution so before we get there um one of the asks that has come to us from uh you know from our investors is hey make sure you're building this as a modern cloud native application 
And um, the first time I heard this term and I was like scratching my head, what does this mean really, right? Does it, does it really mean that I just take my application and run it in the cloud? Or do I need to do some things differently? Do I need to think about my application's architecture in a different way uh, when, when you say a cloud native application? Um, so the next part of our conversation is really gonna to touch upon these concepts of microservices, virtual machines and containers. Um, we'll try and understand the, uh, the underpinnings of those. We'll try and understand why do we need these things in the first place as well. So uh, you will get a lot of different answers uh, around cloud native, uh, more or less overlapping. Uh, I've tried to distill what cloud native means in uh, some of the blocks out here. Uh, the more obvious one is, yes, the application runs on a cloud infrastructure. And yes, it takes advantage of the elasticity of the cloud infrastructure, right? So the horizontal scaling, uh, uh, not just scaling up, but being able to scale down when you don't need the infrastructure. Um, some people would also like to tag along and say that your application design more or less uh, has to be cloud agnostic, um, which means that if you build your application, say have it running on an AWS environment today, how hard or difficult is it for you to migrate it to an Azure environment or a Google Cloud environment? Um, I think this point is a little debatable um, though. A cloud agnost uh, the ability to be cloud agnostic um, is not necessarily a core tenet when we look at cloud native applications, uh, but it's definitely a nice characteristic to have because it gives you the flexibility to migrate between cloud providers. And as you will see later in the conversation, when we look at this idea of containers and we look at contain, something called container orchestration, um, there is a lot of industry standardization that's happening uh, there in that space. So when you try to package your application and deploy it, um, containers have all, almost become like the common operating system across cloud providers, uh, which gives you that portability between cloud providers. Um, another, important aspect that starts to emerge is if you're building really a large and a complex application, you wanna start breaking it down into more manageable pieces, right? More manageable components, if you will. Um, that's where this idea of microservices starts to emerge that don't try to build everything as one large uh, monolithic application, if you will, but start to break up your application into different business areas. So if you go back to our example from earlier, maybe you have a product catalog, um, a catalog of say about a large number of products, say about two, three, four million products, um, you know, is maybe one area of business responsibility. Then you have your cart and checkout uh, process, uh, right? Where you're processing credit cards, accepting payments, uh, accepting like shipping information and so on from your customers. That's another area of uh, business responsibility. Um, possibly your shipping and fulfillment is the third one and so on and so forth. So the idea being that you have to start breaking up your applications into smaller chunks. And you think of these chunks as um, being a service, having a well-defined API. So your application now starts to become these bunch of loosely coupled components uh, that are offering the logic, right? The business logic over an API. And they are, these components are talking to each other over standard web protocols. Um, so this could be like an HTTP REST kind of a protocol, um, or it could be some kind of a message queue, message passing kind of mechanism as well um, that allows for this loose coupling between the components. Um, now, now that you've built these services, you also wanna make sure that each service can be packaged and independently deployable. This is an important part of it, right? So what it means is that each area of business, each business responsibility can be a team by itself building that service. And that team has a degree of independence, a degree of autonomy to start to not just build and evolve and improve their service, but also to be able to independently deploy it uh, when they are ready as opposed to multiple teams waiting for each other, you know, waiting in a very strict lockstep um, that's again, one of the tenets of microservices. If we can allow for teams to uh, be more independent in evolving each of their service capabilities. 
this also calls out that your services should be packaged in something called containers and uh, containers are the unit in which uh, these services can be running in a cloud environment uh, in our last session we only briefly talked about them uh, in our conversation further we will deep dive into what we mean by containers and so on so moving further along uh, another idea behind uh, microservices is uh, each service could use a purpose specific technology so for example i have a service that processes maybe image files uh, i have another service that simply uh, aggregates all the all the sales information into some kind of an analytics platform i have another service that simply lets me search uh, for products in my catalog right now you may realize that um, each of these capabilities may be better solved for by maybe a different programming language or maybe by a different database platform or by a different file storage so the idea being that each of the microservices team has a degree of independence to choose what is the best of the breed uh, language framework uh, storage mechanism uh, to implement that service and because these services are loosely coupled right they talk through a common protocol which could be like an http rest protocol uh, it doesn't matter what language the service is being implemented in in some ways uh, building on that thought is uh, this idea that each service also has a fairly uh, self contained uh, data model and a data storage of its own so as far as possible i mean purists of microservices will certainly endorse this that every microservice needs to have its own call it database uh, call it state um, which is not directly shared with other services um which is good in a way because i think that that's what brings a degree of independence to the service team uh it also means that you no longer think of your application database as this one large centralized database uh which of course could have given you challenges like hey how far can i scale my database right can, does this database become a single point of failure or a single point of bottleneck for me so almost along the lines of what we looked at horizontal scalability of your runtime code uh we are also talking about starting to break up your data schema into smaller parts and allowing for each team to own that part of the data schema right so sometimes you would see that in a very complex application the schema could be like hundreds of tables of several hundreds of tables and it becomes pretty challenging for say one small team to manage it uh, that's where you start to chunk it into parts and kind of divide uh, your data state as well um something else we talked about the last time design for failure um this comes as a uh, as a theme not just in the hardware and the infrastructure aspects that we talked about last time but in the way we design the software so when you think about design for failure you're saying hey if my service is calling another service and there is a failure <clears throat> right maybe the call didn't go through um what is what should we do in a situation like this uh some thoughts come to mind first you think about retrying right so if my call failed i have to build the ability to retry something um the second maybe uh, the call failed a couple of times after retrying in which case i still can gracefully respond in some ways you know this idea of graceful degradation right uh, if i cannot fully meet my users requirement um i may try to in some cases at least it's not always feasible but in some cases try to partly meet my users requirement so as you think about designing the and building these microservices um design for failure becomes an important mindset to have as well so moving further along um now that we have this application with so many different components and moving parts um begs the question as to how do i really monitor all of these parts uh, right uh, and and you would come across examples where uh, really large scale systems have tens or even hundreds of these microservices running uh, netflix for example if i'm not mistaken the count was somewhere upwards of 5 or 600 different microservices 
uh, which means that how do I know if these services are healthy? Uh, how do I know what is the response performance of each service? Or um, am I getting errors from a service, right? What does my error rate look like from a given service? So the emphasis on what's called as collecting the telemetry from the different services that are running in the cloud and being able to uh, observe that, uh, being able to also define some limits and thresholds on that, right? So if you see that the error rates of a service are going up, it certainly means something is wrong. Now, this idea again is not new, right? I mean, monitoring has been around for a really long time, ever since people have started building IT systems and applications. Uh, but the emphasis here is on having a deeper level of monitoring at a component level very often. Uh, by components, again, I mean microservices here, uh, the ability to have a deeper level of monitoring uh, becomes important here. We touch upon two other important concepts here. Um, one of them has to do with uh, the ability of the team to build and change and evolve the service over a period of time. I mean, if you ask any business owner today, they would say that my technology team needs to innovate fast. Uh, we need to quickly understand our users' requirements and build new features to meet the users' requirements. And guess what? Uh, very often what happens is this entire supply chain of building, you know, writing code, uh, being able to build it, being able to test it, uh, being able to secure it and then deploy it that entire supply chain can have a lot of manual steps in it and that slows the whole process down i mean how you know you probably have some examples where uh, there was this one small bug that you found in production but then you had to go fix it then you had to go deploy it in a qa environment test it there then you had to maybe you know go through some more security scanning on it before you say aha now that small bug that i fixed is now ready to go to production so there is a lot of emphasis on this pipeline, this end-to-end -end pipeline for the developer, for the dev team to be automated. And that's where this emergent idea of DevOps has started to, uh, you know, also quite set in, in, in the marketplace today. Uh, the idea being also that if you are a team that's responsible for a certain part of an application, right, a microservice, then if you build it, you also run it. Uh, which means you also end up owning all of the operational problems and the pain points and things as a team. Uh, it's no longer this world where you say, hey, you just write the code and you make sure your code is you know, functional enough and then you toss it over the wall and some admin will pick it up and figure out a way to run your code. That was the old sort of somewhat older model of thinking about how to uh, you know, operate IT. So with the newer model of cloud native and microservices, uh, what DevOps encourages is that if you are a team that's developing a certain piece of software, you should also be entrusted with operationalizing and running that piece of software in the cloud as well. And that's also where um, automation will play a big role because you don't want a lot of these manual steps um, uh, to come in the way of your velocity, right? When you're trying to uh, ship a lot more features uh, out to the market. So moving on uh, is this last theme uh, that also is a key tenet of cloud native. If, uh, if you've ever built or deployed an application uh, in a traditional sort of a server environment or IT environment, you would essentially say, look, that particular server is my, uh, is my database server. And that particular server, by the way, runs my, uh, runs my uh, application server. And that other one is my web server. And that other one is my cache, right? So there was a sense of affinity, you know, where your piece of software was running on specific instance of the infrastructure. So with the cloud, uh, the, that, notion of affinity starts to go away. Because what happens is if one piece of infrastructure um, is, uh, say, has a maintenance problem or goes down, uh, you have the ability to migrate, almost migrate or move your workload from infrastructure instance A to an infrastructure instance B. Uh, of course, you have to reroute your traffic, you know, um, reconfigure your load balancing and things like that. 
but the affinity of your application with specific instance of the infrastructure starts to dismantle the when you talk about cloud native architectures and that kind of that's why we say that the infrastructure is um, sort of fleeting or ephemeral in nature uh, which means that um, if one piece of infrastructure is sick you can tear it down and instantiate a new piece of infrastructure on demand to run your application on it um, this also brings us to another concept here called uh, immutability. So, um, and, and a great analogy uh, that you know, you've probably heard this term called cattle versus pets. Um, think of it this way: uh, if you have a if you have a pet at home, you probably are emotionally attached to the pet, right? Um, if the pet is sick, you take him or her to the vet. Um, and uh, nurse it to health. Um, that paradigm is akin to say, you know, my application having some problems on a certain piece of infrastructure and there is a problem. I actually log into that machine. I try to look at the logs and see what's going wrong. Um, I maybe try to restart that machine manually or I try to uh, rebounce my application and so on and so forth, right? Or maybe I try to change some configuration there to fix the problem. So that notion is uh, akin to having a pet. Uh, you are trying to nurse something back to good health. Uh, on the other hand, in the cloud environment, you tend to think a little differently. Um, infrastructure being somewhat disposable in nature, uh, virtual infrastructure, at least the notion of it being somewhat disposable in nature, uh, you tend to look at it as a herd of cattle. So more often than not, uh, if uh, one cattle cannot do the job, you go to another one. And in all likelihood, there is little to no emotional attachment to a herd of, you know, you don't give them names, for example, you will not give them individual names, for example. Um, or if one cattle is sick, you want to make sure the rest of the herd is protected from the sick one. So you probably put it to rest, uh, lay it to rest, and then you still keep the other herd and maybe you breed more cattle instances, right? So that's, that's really how you start to look at the infrastructure differently when you think of cloud native applications as well. There's probably a lot to take in, um, and we'll, we'll re, uh, revisit some of these themes uh, as we go further along in the conversation today. All right. So moving further, um, we've almost talked about the different facets of microservices by now. Uh, I wanted to leave you with a few references. Um, this slide I have borrowed generously from the work, uh, Martin Fowler's work. Uh, feel free to go read his blog if you want to learn a little bit more about microservices. Um, when you build applications as, mic as microservices, um, there are also a few common patterns that, uh, that emerge here. Um, one of the patterns is where when one service wants to talk to another, um, it cannot bind to the other service using a specific IP address or some such because services are potentially moving, right, as we discussed between infrastructure, different parts of the infrastructure, uh, which means you need some kind of a directory lookup. You know, it's an additional level of indirection, if you will, where if, if service A wants to talk to service B, service A probably first has to do a lookup at that moment, almost at that moment in time, to say, where is service B really running? Once you know that, then you can invoke service B. Uh, this is somewhat akin to this idea of, say, an internet DNS, where um, to resolve a host name to an IP address, you first do a DNS lookup. Uh, there are other aspects uh, that are considered in microservices, this notion of a circuit breaker, for example, um, where if a service is calling another service, say, a service A calling a service B, and uh, that call fails, what do you do? You retry, uh, fails again, and so on and so forth. So at some point, uh, you don't want to overwhelm uh, the target or the recipient service as well. I mean, the very analogy of circuit breakers today uh, in electrical systems as well. You, you break the circuit, which means you stop your retries at that point, and you start to generate a response back, which is, which is probably a great, you know, this idea of graceful degradation that we talked about, this kind of overlaps with that, uh, with that idea as well. 
Uh, another challenge you will face as a microservices developer when something goes wrong is I got a request from my client app. It hit my microservice. And then my service called another service and that service called another service. So you have a chain of services calling each other to get the job done. Um, but something went wrong. So the ability to trace a single request through that entire chain of services uh, also becomes a challenge. Uh, this is where uh, certain capabilities like distributed tracing come into picture where you may actually insert a request ID that gets that essentially migrates from one service to another as the call goes deeper into the stack. And that allows you to eventually reconstruct what happened to this call, right? Where did it go wrong? Or at what service did the call really fail? Um, those are some of the uh, notions that will come up as you think about building microservices in your applications. Uh, this, this is an interesting uh, site as well, microservices.io. They talk about some of these patterns in, uh, in depth. Uh, they also talk about some of the do's and don'ts and uh, some of the frameworks and tools that people have been using to build microservices. Too. Uh, there's one other idea that we we didn't talk about quite a bit. Uh, let's look at the picture on the left. Uh, we have your application built as one big package, right? So all the different capabilities of your application are part of one big package, uh, which is called the monolith. And you scale it by creating by instantiating multiple copies of that in the cloud. Uh, that's great. Um, on the right, you see this idea where you've created smaller services. And what happens at deployment is each of these can, because each of these can be deployed independently, you could prob probably have more copies of some service and less copies of another. So a certain service, say, like search, searching in your catalog or searching for a product may be a lot more common than another service like a product return, right? Returning a product or maybe even completing a checkout process. So this degree of independence allows you to scale each service independently. Uh, that's another takeaway from this idea of uh, microservices here. Okay, um, let's move further along um, and talk about, uh, I, I wanna talk about how do we actually deploy these services, right? We talked about uh, the idea of containers um, and virtual machines. So why do we need them? Uh, that's kind of the next part of our conversation now. Um, the basic tenet here is um, that what does it take for multiple applications to run on a shared piece of hardware or a shared piece of infrastructure? And for those of you who are from a computer science background, you're prob you know, very familiar with this notion of multi-programming. Uh, any given program slash a program in uh, instantiated program as a process um, often blocks for IO, right? So this could be reading stuff from the disk or reading something from a database or waiting for network traffic to come through. And that IO is much slower than, uh, than your compute, right? Than your CPU. So, um, people wondered as to if my program is pretty much blocking for IO, why can't I have, uh, you know, in the meantime, really keep this process aside, uh, bring in another process and run it on my hardware, right? Run it on my CPU. Um, and if I do it fast enough, right? This idea of context switching between processes uh, where you swap out the first one, you bring in the second one, you swap out the second one, you bring in the third one. Uh, and if I do it fast enough, I can give my users an illusion that these processes are actually running in a concurrent manner. Right? It's exactly what happens, say, when on your phone, you're browsing the web while listening to music with possibly a video playing in the background with some push notifications coming to you. Um, that's that's multi-programming in action right there. So, um, Unix and most modern operating systems support that notion. Um, this is also backed by the underlying CPU architecture, uh, which allows for each process to have its own virtual memory space and so on. Um, but there is also a challenge uh, in multi-programming, which is 
that processes can cause side effects to each other. So if you think about it, a process may be very greedy in its consumption of hardware resources, uh, right? It may want a lot more memory. It may want a lot more disk uh, space to be consumed and so on. Um, there's also this uh, challenge in some cases where a process may step over each other. Um, um, in, in some cases, the operating system takes care of creating those partitions. Uh, for example, say you've written a process that's listening on port 80, and I've written a process that's listening on port 80. Uh, your process has already captured the port. Uh, it's bound to the port. And my, my process just starts off and it fails because it cannot get the resource that it needs, right? So this is one example where the operating system is already trying to sort of create that separation between what processes can do or where can they overlap with each other. Um, it's also possible that processes could um, maliciously take control of the system, uh, right? And, and hurt other processes in the system. Uh, but for, for the most part today, my, you know, operating systems are good enough to draw that line where uh, as a user space process, you cannot, uh, you cannot run privileged instructions. Uh, only the kernel or only the, uh, the operating system is allowed to run privileged instructions on the underlying hardware. So with this model in place, um, one could think that, hey, this is great. You know, if I have hardware that's shared hardware in the cloud, I could actually use multi-programming and, uh, and allow multiple users of the cloud to run their programs uh, on the shared hardware. What we realize is if we think a little bit deeper that that level of isolation that most traditional OS has offered was not enough. So for, you know, these are some examples where um, the, pro the, the process wasn't contained or sandboxed enough by the OS. Um, the amount of CPU that the process can hog or uh, the process actually consuming a lot more uh, memory uh, or doing some excessive IO writes which means that you're depriving other processes running on the same hardware. Um, or for example, um, can we control which libraries are visible to the process? Can we control what IP addresses and port numbers are available for the process to use? So there was an emerging need to have a stronger sandboxing capability, uh, stronger than what the traditional notion of operating systems allowed us to do in terms of process sandboxing. There's another need that emerged very soon, uh, which is the need to contain all your application dependencies. At the example on the right, your application has a bunch of business logic and you build it on your local machine, local environment as a developer, and then you toss it over, you send it to me. And when I try to run it, it it likely fails. And then we realize, oops, your application needed a bunch of libraries. You know, it used a bunch of jar files in the Java environment, say, or if it's a Node.js environment, it needed a bunch of NPM, uh, you know, library files. Um, your application also needed certain environment variables to be configured in the right way. Um, it maybe needed the right app server um, or a Java container, uh, you know, to, to be able to run the application in the first place. Um, it was a Java based application. So I had to install the JVM in the first place. So as you can see, it, it is quite challenging for what seemed to run easily on your environment. It's quite challenging to replicate that in my environment because I have to take, tick off all of these boxes right here, ensure that all of those, the blue boxes here are met exactly. Only then can your application code run successfully in my environment. And this is a very common problem um, in, in most production scale systems because uh, the developers are building in their local environment, then they are deploying it to maybe some kind of a integration environment. You're then moving it to some kind of a QA environment. You're moving it to some kind of a demo or a UAT environment before it goes to production. And each of those are opportunities where some dependency may not be met effectively. And hence this 
code that was trying to go from one environment to another will fail. So the, the real emergent need here was, can I package these dependencies together? And then send the package over so that it's easy to reproduce the environment wherever you want to run it, wherever you want to run my application. And as you will see later, both virtual machines and containers uh, have a role to play in, in, in giving us this box where we can not just have our application code, our compiled application code, if you will, but also contain all the dependencies like libraries, environment variables, application servers, nicely together in one package um, to drive that reproducibility or, or, or the ability to replicate your application in multiple places. Moving on, uh, from the previous, uh, from the second need, we actually see that even this is not enough. Uh, what happens is your application stack is not just a single node by itself. It often is gonna need a database server. It's probably gonna need a file storage. It's gonna need a server, some kind of a caching in memory cache. Uh, maybe it needs a load balancer and so on, right? Uh, so your application, if one may say, is a multi-tiered application in reality. And what you're trying to replicate is not just this blue box here, the, uh, the application itself, you know, which is really this entire thing, but a topology of multiple interconnected components. And you want to be able to, when you say you're replicating your application, you're actually replicating the entire topology. Right? Each of these is, say, a database is a server onto itself, a server instance onto itself. Um, a file storage is probably um, an NFS-mounted file service or something like that. So um, building on this idea of packaging everything together is this idea of being able to specify what your application topology is. You know, what does your application really need to run successfully and be able to replicate that in a cloud environment? And the last one is also interesting. Um, we, we've touched this as part of the horizontal scaling before. Um, let's look at the image on the left. So I have two distinct services that I wanna build and deploy. Okay, there is service one, which is represented in green, and there is service two represented in blue. Um, my service one receives a lot more traffic. So I have been able to not just create one instance of the service, but I have six instances of the service running, or five possibly. Uh, service two, on the other hand, um, doesn't receive as much traffic. So I only have two instances of the service running. Right? Um, but here is uh, what I really need. Uh, what I need is, is, is some kind of a component that would continue to monitor my service, first of all, say monitor all of these running instances of the service and realize, oops, instance number three seems to have some trouble. It's not healthy anymore. So let me try and terminate it, right? Let me try and kill it and actually create a new instance number six to replace it, right? This is the notion of self-healing, uh, if you will, uh, that I need as well. Um, here is another aspect to look at. Um, because a service is a collection of multiple instances, but to any consumer of the service, right, they don't really know how many instances of the service are running in the back. So any consumer of the service has to be able to use a logical name of the service and invoke it, right, be able to call it. So I also need this piece of capability where um, there is service abstraction and there is some kind of a load balancing of the traffic that happens between these instances of the service. And the same problem is not, not only when a client is trying to call my service, the same problem also happens when one service is trying to call another. Right? When service one wants to call service two, it may not already know or you know, it's not predetermined as to a certain IP address is where service two will be running. 
uh, that IP address could change because service two itself is adaptive, right? The deployment of service two also is elastic in nature. So there is a need to have this kind of an orchestrator that can uh, manage the entirety of your cluster. Um, and as we can see later, this notion of container orchestrators do exactly that. Uh, when we talk about uh, tools like Kubernetes, they um, allow you to scale your individual instances of containers. They allow containers to talk to each other or services to talk to each other. Um, they monitor the health of those in individual instances as well and, and be able to terminate an instance and create a new one uh, if required. So um, with this said, I just want to quickly recap the, the two or three things we talked about. Uh, one, you need strong process isolation. Um, two, you need to bundle or package all of your application dependencies uh, together uh, so that you can replicate your application easily. Um, three, you need uh, to also replicate the application's topology or the different resources that your application needs in a, in a, in a predictable way. And fourth is if you're talking about horizontally scaling, you need this babysitter, you need this orchestrator that can automate this for you, right? Every time something goes down, you don't wanna manually come in and fix something or repair something. So those are the four key tenets that really lead us to this notion of uh, both virtualization and containerization in some ways. Um, when you think about strong process isolation, uh, people started to question as to, just like I run multiple processes on a hardware, why cannot I run multiple operating systems on a given piece of hardware, right? Um, so if I could somehow take my hardware and multiplex it, create this notion of a virtual machine abstraction on top of one, one shared piece of hardware, and then possibly run two different operating systems on top of it, um, and these could be two completely different operating systems, right? It, one of them could be Linux. The other one could be Microsoft Windows, um, which means each of them have their own kernel, their own running kernel. Uh, the operating system has, so to speak, booted up on top of this virtual machine abstraction. And in that operating system, I have my application and the libraries and whatever binary dependencies and things that my application needs. So as you can see, because these two are entirely different OSs, the level of isolation is a lot stronger. That's one, uh, compared to only a multi-programming environment that we saw before. Um, also, uh, if I encapsulate the OS and the libraries as one package, uh, right? I take a snapshot, think of taking a snapshot of a machine like this. That's what you call as a virtual machine image, which is your OS plus your dependencies, plus your application combined together as one image. You could now replicate that image wherever you want, right? This could be in the developer's environment. This could be in the cloud. This could be in your data center and, and so on. Now, um, it's important to note that um, each OS in a way has been designed to operate in a very unfettered way, right? So an OS knows that it can take charge of all the hardware resources, all the underlying hardware resources on, on that infrastructure and run all of the privileged commands that it can, right? On say an x86 platform or something like that. So getting two OSs to play nice with each other is not easy, uh, right? And that's really where this role of this component that you see called hypervisor comes in picture. Um, so the hypervisor is really the one that's taking charge of all the hardware resources, underlying hardware resources, and then offering a machine abstraction so that each guest OS feels it's given an illusion that it's running by itself, independent of anyone else uh, running on that infrastructure. So as you can see, virtualization has started to solve some of these problems we talked about earlier, right? Isolation, packaging things together. It also did solve, um, other aspects like self-healing. Um, there are orchestrators available in the virtualization environment where it can monitor the health of VMs 
it can migrate the vm from one machine to another one node to another um, or sometimes you may want to migrate it because the, the node is undergoing a maintenance or a planned maintenance uh, for example um you could also replicate your topology right this topology that we looked at say a database server is available as a virtual machine image that i run on some nodes some some machines um, my app server and my application is an image and then i set up the networking rules to interconnect them as well now there have been quite a few providers in the market who provide these hypervisors today um, so one can think of names like vmware for example they have a vsphere uh, hypervisor uh, you have hypervisors from citrix zen um, or microsoft has one which is the hyper v um very often though what has also been seen is that the compatibility is a challenge between uh, these uh, hypervisor providers the virtual machine image formats uh, tend to be not very compatible across them um as we will see later that this uh, idea of docker and kubernetes is coming together in the cloud have started to actually bring uh, bring a much stronger sort of common platform uh, that is less proprietary um, um more agnostic of of who your supplier is if you will as well um and so the industry has started to converge in terms of those standardizations coming about which is nice because for you as a developer or um, or an application you know maintainer um you don't want to be bounded by the proprietary standards of a given supplier in some ways as well so if this is virtualization let's continue to build on this um what happened is over the over the year as the linux kernel itself started becoming a lot more powerful uh some of these process isolation gaps that we talked about earlier started to become available as kernel features uh so uh, the idea that the kernel can now almost create an illusion for each process that it is truly living in a world of its own truly living in an operating system where it is the only process running um and so there were kernel features like namespaces c groups um i i have a few references at the end of the presentation which uh, if you if you want to double click on what what are these kernel features that have allowed for better process isolation um so as you can see we you know the need for hypervisors sort of chipped away and the os kernel itself started to offer um these stronger isolation capabilities and uh, companies like docker built what was called as a container engine uh, which which took benefit of these kernel features and so we kind of back to the multi programming paradigm but with a stronger chinese wall as you can see between applications uh, this notion that i have uh, what's called as a container image which really is my application with a bunch of dependencies bundled together uh, it of course was also talks about you know what operating system does the image need and so on and then i instantiate this container image as an actual container on top of the container engine in my uh, in my environment uh, so when people talk about docker for example they are actually talking about a container engine and a and a image format or packaging format uh, for your application and its dependencies so i think this is a great time for us to take a quick fork off into um containers and docker uh, we have a, a a quick demo of being able to uh, run a a docker image and a quick demo of also creating our own docker image and 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 running it so a uh, couple of my colleagues here are on the line yagnesh and kalpesh um would you guys like to take over and talk us through the demo sure roshan thanks a lot hey team this is agnesh here and i have kalpesh along with me uh thanks roshan for setting up the foundation for us um, now there is an interesting reality of life where things definitely fail for sure when we don't expect them to and that is true i'm pretty sure almost all of us must have experienced it and if you don't trust me i'm definitely envy so 
uh, now the the things fail because we do not have consistent environment across and there are dependencies which are must haves for the uh, artifacts that we distribute uh, for example any application uh, that i really want to go and deploy on my clients uh, machines or maybe across the environments it will have some dependencies in terms of libraries some versions of the libraries and if they are not met it will definitely fail how do i really go and make sure that i get i um, get them all sorted out as a part of my distribution itself and that's what we generally call as in packaging right where all your dependencies are part of your distribution itself uh, I mean, this packaging is truly speaking not truly speak uh, as such new. I mean, think about the uh, the packaging of uh, maybe Java platform or Java world, right? I mean, what we have seen is that we have jar files or we have war files. Now, what do they do? They really keep the class files which are like compiled, but in the bytecode form. And uh, the way we call it like a platform independent is that wherever you have Java, if you go and run it, it will run. Right. And this gives you sort of a lot more uh, predictability that your application, when it's distributed, it will run at your target place. But Java is only one part of it. It's not, again, 100% confirmed because many times it may also happen that what if your application has been built with Java, maybe JDK 8, or it is compiled with JDK 8, and it may not really work with uh, JDK 11, or maybe other way around is at times it happens that your comp application has been compiled with JDK 11 and uh, your target uh, audience is having JDK 8 installed on their instance or machine, or maybe it is not there at all. In these cases, your application may not really work over there. So uh, idea with the Docker images is that why don't you start giving all the dependencies of your system along with your system rather than depending on them. Uh, just like Java, for Java case, we always think that okay, JDK will be installed on the target, over here, we will only expect that a Docker will be there uh, as an installed system. And uh, with that, when Docker being installed over the target system, almost any application which are containerized or built with the Docker imaging style will be able to go and make sure that they can run over there. So first thing that we will have to have on our system, it can be your own local system, laptop, uh, desktop, or it can be a VM that you might have, have on the cloud as well. So, and any cloud, I mean, you have Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, no matter where you really want to have it, you have a VM in that you go and install a, a simple service, which you call as a Docker manager or Docker service. Uh, once you install it over there, uh, so I have uh, my colleague Kalpesh who is sharing his screen at this point of time. And if you install that from your command line interface, you can check whether you have Docker installed in your system or not. Docker info will help you to confirm whether it is there. Once you have it, you have a confidence that now you will be able to go and run an application which has been shipped or distributed in the form of Docker image. Now, Docker images are generally kept at a centralized repositories. There are multiple repositories which are available and one of the most commonly used uh, repository that are available is available at Docker Hub. So the website is hub.docker.com. If you go over there, you can really find uh, a lot of commonly used uh, Docker images for the most commonly used applications like Nginx, MongoDB, Linux, Node.js, Redis, MySQL, Postgres. You talk it and you will find it, right? So uh, in, as a part of this demo, what we will try to do is that we will, to begin with, run a MySQL server on my VM. Okay, uh, so it's not a VM actually. We are running it on uh, Kalpesh's machine. He's having uh, a Mac machine at the same at this time on his machine, and we want to run uh, Docker. Sorry, uh, my my MySQL on his machine. Generally, otherwise, what we would have done is that we would have done brew install maybe MySQL or something like that, or maybe he would have downloaded MySQL zip file or DMZ file from the uh, website of MySQL, and then he would have all installed it. But we will be doing it with the help of docker over here so let's try to search mysql image do we find it or not okay mysql it's coming up with some results and yeah i 
you can see that there are multiple results and we we'll make sure that you look out for an official image because you will find a lot of images because there are people who have been trying to figure uh, find and ship their own variants or flavors of my sequels as well so prefer to get something which is the official image so go to the MySQL image uh, uh, part of that Docker Hub. And over here, the very first portion, it says that Docker official images, it gives you the confidence that this is something that you can trust because it's been published by an official uh, per, uh, publisher of MySQL. So name of the MySQL image is actually MySQL itself at the very first part of this thing, MySQL. That is your image name. Uh, then there is a documentation which has been given over here uh, you will find uh, all the commands that you need to fire in order to run your docker on your machine image as a container and uh, you will then think that okay there can be so many different flavors of mysql right there can be mysql version 5.7 it can be mysql version 8 or something so which one do i really want to run and uh, that you can get based on by giving using the terminology which is called as tags so tag is the way by which you say that a single flavor of the application which can come with different version or the flavors how do you refer them so tags is the mechanism in which uh, the docker gave you the opportunity so docker images which are hosted over here they are simply a static image just like jar right so when you say jar jar is only a object which is residing on your file system it does not it is not a runtime it is simply a jar as a file system object when you run a command like java minus jar and the jar name at that point of time it really comes up into the runtime it start running your application really comes alive exactly in the same way in the world of docker your images are also simply a file system object they are simply a file on your file system you have to run it via some command you will find that command for the respective uh, application that you want to run on the same docker hub uh, website itself so you run that command and that will make sure that if you don't have that image on your local machine because see you just have installed a docker on your system you will definitely not have this mysql as an image on your local system there will be like tens of hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, images which are there available now not all of them will be available on your system correct so when you run uh, this particular docker command docker has been designed in such a way that it implies that it has if it doesn't find that docker image on your local machine it will try to fetch it from docker hub so over here let's look at very quickly that uh, first of all let's check whether we have anything as in docker running a docker container running on my system so for that you can fire a command docker ps okay Co compare it with the linux command right in the linux when we want to figure out what all what all processes are running on my operating system we can fire command ps exactly in the same way when your docker images are running that is called as container every time i start an image or i run an image that is like we i'm, I'm spinning up a new container and that uh, those list of containers i can find out by simply firing a command docker ps at this point of time there are no containers which are running and uh, let's try to run a particular container uh, with the image of mysql so let's look at the command very quickly so docker run is the command which will help me to start a container now to start a container i have to tell which container i which image i really want to use so that i will find at the very end of this command which is mysql but which version of mysql so i give it the tag so mysql colon and then the image tag if you don't provide that tag that is fine it will use the latest image but it's not the best practice in general because uh, by the time you keep on building your application in the meantime new version of the mysql may come and it might not be 100 percent compatible with the application that you might have built right so that's why you generally prefer to give a specific tag so you give it with the explicit tag then the very first part of the application uh, sorry command where we say minus minus name that attribute after that you give some name it's a very logical name you, you give whatever you name whatever name you want to give it to the container uh why we give name is because you you can run multiple instances of mysql on your single vm itself so how do you really figure out very clearly that this is my mysql in, uh, instance for application one or this is for mysql instance for my application two so you can give some logical name human friendly name to your container runtime then there will be some possible 
optional attributes that you might want to pass on. For example, in case of MySQL, your MySQL will not start unless until it does not have the password to use it against the root to login. Because when your MySQL server start, this is MySQL server. So server will require a password for your root user. So this particular container image expects a few more parameters as an environment variable. Over here, we are passing it uh, as an argument. So minus E is the environment variable, just like your operating system environment variable over here inside your container, because that is like a virtualized sandboxed environment where your application will think that I am having an, an, uh, an operating system under which I am running, but it will be, uh, this environment variable will be available only within that container. It will not be available for another container where I'm not passing it. Uh, that's what, what we have been talking about as in sandboxing because all applications will be having their own private state and the runtime environment. So this extra parameter, uh, I can pass as many environment variable as I want to. Second thing as in parameter that I'm passing is the port because MySQL is in service when it is running, it is listening on a port. Why? Because someone, my application or my MySQL client should be in position to go and make sure that they are able to call that uh, MySQL, connect with it, perform some operations like uh, create database, read, the, uh, read or fire some queries, drop some uh, records, whatever they want to. So for that, it has to connect on a port. So default port for MySQL is 3306. So the, some way I have to make sure that from my local machine, let's say, I want to connect to that my, my VM in short. Uh, I want to connect to the MySQL which is running inside the container. Now, whenever I do not really pass this parameter minus P, I will not be able to reach out to that port or MySQL which is running inside the container. And that's what we have been talking about as a security where we get a truly speaking isolation uh, for the applications where unless and until you do not really open them up, nobody will be able to go and connect with them. So, but, but my requirement at this point of time is that I will, I should be in position to connect with that MySQL server, which is running inside that container. So I have to bind one port on my VM in with the port, which is running inside the container. So over here, in order to have a very uh, easy way of distinguishing the so uh, host port as well as the container port, uh, we are keeping a different port for the host which is 3307 but i could have actually kept it 3306 as well that means on my local machine whatever i can provide as a very far for first part what uh, we are highlighting right now 3307 that is my host or the guest oss port and colon and then the con port within the container the docker service will bridge this port or that this port in a such a way that any request that comes on my port, on my host machine's port 3307, it will route that traffic inside the container, which, which container, so the one that I'm running right now, I'm trying to start right now, on port number 3306 inside that container, okay? So if you see at the very bottom, at this point of time, we are running a command, which is keeping a watch on the Docker PS. So if you see every two seconds, it is refreshing that. And at this point of time, it is uh, not able to see any containers running. But when we will run the command on the top, when we submit that command, let's try to submit it. And we will keep a watch on the bottom. Now, uh, uh, once we submit that command, we will immediately see that the container has started. I mean, we can see it has got container ID, then the image with which it is running, the command which we started it, it created like nine, 10 seconds ago. And it has been up at this point of time, the status is up and it is having ports. And in this port, for the port which we have bound from my host machine, it is clearly telling us that a port on the host machine, which is 3307, is directing the request to the port 3306 inside the container. And the very last column over here is the name, which is the name of my container that we provided at the minus minus name parameter at the very first command. Correct. And uh, similarly, the uh, when we fired that command, it gave a, it returned us one ID, B B B6422. That is the container ID. So when we fire any command, yes, that is the container ID, which you will also see in the Docker PS as well at the bottom. Uh, so this this ID as well as names are uh, interchangeable in terms of when we want to use it. So anything that I want to operate with my container, they let's see if I want to check the logs of my container, I can fire command Docker log and the container name or container ID. Let's, let's quickly check it, Docker log container ID or container name, any either of them is fine. 
and this will give me the logs which which came as an std out of my container and uh, it will help me to confirm whether my container started or not and uh, if there's any anything that was uh, of causing it a, a problem i will also be able to find out from that but this time we are lucky uh, we have been able to run it uh, very gracefully start it uh, in one go itself thanks to docker and uh, with this let's confirm whether i'm able to connect to uh, the docker container which is running at this point of time from my local machine so uh, we have mysql workbench which is like a mysql client on uh, mac os over here and uh, we want to connect it so what we do is that we create a new connection object i'm connecting to 127.0.0.1 which is my local machine i have to connect to 3307 and not 3306 right because my local machine support 3307 has been my, my uh, pointing to the 3306 inside the container so i have to provide the credential that is the username and password username is root by default and i have to give the password which i have passed as a at the time of firing the command so we provide that same password over here uh, i'm sorry for some background noise uh, and try to test the connection and uh, that's, that's where we go we are just too fortunate enough to connect to the mysql in very first go and uh, now this container is running and uh, let's see uh, let's try to do some operation with the mysql the very first thing that we can do and confirm is that yeah whether i am able to see all the objects uh, that comes as an out of the box in the mysql when we start when we install any my fresh mysql instance so let's try to figure out what all databases which are there already or or maybe we can start creating a database let's say we can start a new database create a new database yeah so we have script ready for that let's create a database and uh, insert some objects inside it okay so we have got all the objects now let's figure out whether we have all database that we are expecting with us or not yep we can see that demo database are over here and uh, that's quite good i mean nothing sweeter than this in one go we have got our database running up and uh, available to use now is it good enough technically speaking we are able to see that we are able to return the data with when we are firing the select queries and all but is it really good enough uh, we heard the term that roshan mentioned some time back if a moral term like cattle versus pet what, what do we really mean that uh, by these things let's try to experiment and experience it uh now that at this point of time we are having this container running but see this is the application it can crash for any given reason no because no system is perfect systems are bound to fail it can fail because of multiple reason we don't care about for what reason but uh, if it fails and if but we want to bring it back and we when we want to bring it back my uh expectation is that i should not be losing my database right because this is something which is state my application state i don't want to lose it if my application which is running my database application which is running as a container kind of goes for a toss so at this point of time let's try to at least uh, um, deal, i mean stop this container let's try to stop this container which is in a way we are simulating that my container goes away so let's stop this container command is docker stop you can either fire the container via container id or via the uh, container name either ways it is fine so let's stop it and you will see at the very bottom uh, you will that name will go away there you go now container is gone away uh, let's remove that containers uh, this the details because otherwise it will not allow me to start that container once again with the same name so let's remove the container reference okay we will kind of, we'll will possibly go in the details of that removal of the container maybe at a later point but uh, at least at this point of time assume that you have lost that container and now you want to start that container once again because you want to make sure that your container has to keep on running so let's start the container once again that's great we have got a container at this point of time with a different id if you see last time we were having id with b6 something like that but this time it has got a new container id randomly generated the name is still same why because we have still kept it same uh that's good i got my class my mysql back but have i got it really back let's check it in the mysql workbench so if it has been restored in a right way my fire my command for that select uh 
we can try out the show databases once yes and uh, let's see if i see my database again or not semicolon yeah Oh, okay. Yeah, I have to reconnect it again, right? Because the connect TCP socket which was connected with my previous session has already got geared up. So I will have to reconnect to my database. Let's quickly reconnect and see the database. Okay. Wow. Where is my demo database? See, this is what we call as an FM model. That means whatever you had created in its runtime back then you have lost it why because your mysql it did write everything in the file system yes it did but it didn't write into the file system which was permanent okay your context about your mysql went away when you lost your container so how do i really go and make sure that i do not really end up into this kind of situation because in this case if you really see this you this is going to be your first and foremost reason why you don't want to use containers but that is not how you should we should be thinking because containers are definitely still rightly designed where they have to be ephemeral we will see the reason behind it very very uh, uh, very soon but there is already a mechanism which is available you can go to the docker hub and it will show you how you can make sure that some folder or some drive that you have on your local I mean, on your host machine available from your host machine that you can mount inside your container okay as a as a volume and that way it will help you to make sure that even if you lose your container but till the time you make sure that you you pass that same parameter to your container next time when you run the container if you pass that same path and all you will get your state back and this is the way you can get the persistence in your containers which are ephemeral by nature so i hope at least this gives us a very clear idea about what do we mean by the ephemeral in terms of the nature for the containers now all this file that we have done is that we are using some image which has been shipped by someone else but what if i really want to go and do the same thing for my application so let's do a very quick walkthrough about my application which is going to be let's say a java based application which i would be building uh, a very basic very plain vanilla spring boost application which is exposing one rest endpoint uh, a very not even rest endpoint it's a basic query html sort of rest endpoint and uh, i want to make sure that i package it in the form of docker image and i can give it to someone else so that they can consistently just like i was able to seamlessly run mysql on my machine just because i had docker same way if i really give my image uh, to someone else they should be able to run my application just like a charm and for that what we need to do is that i have to create one docker file a file with the name as docker file which is the convention you can have some other name as well but generally the standard is that people generally keep it as a docker file otherwise you can pass an argument as an additional argument to specify what is the docker file name so let's go and prepare a docker file over here let's quickly look at the docker file con content over here it starts with the line from open jdk and then colon and some tag we are against after it right? think of this as just another inheritance in the application programming that we have been doing right in the application programming when we talk about inheritance we say that if b is extending a what do we mean by that that means that whatever is there in a will be available with b on top of it b will have some additional properties of it it may be additional attributes it can be additional functions it might have overridden some function uh, or overloaded some functions there can be anything so uh, exactly in the same way in the world of docker you can imagine this way because what we are saying my application is a java based application and when it is a java based application what does it really need the first and foremost it needs is operating system obviously second it needs a jdk right or jre so and that's why we are building the our image by using another image as a base image base image for us right just like have a base class i have a base image over here so when i say from open jdk that means that use an open jdk image from the docker hub because i'm not specifying the image source that means it is going to be docker hub so from the docker hub use the open jdk now that open jdk image has been built by someone else for me thanks to them and what they have done is that they have kept upper, upper other operating um, some operating system as a part of their open uh, base image okay so uh, which open jdk i want to use because open jdk can be 8 jdk 9 jdk 11 jdk 10 so many of them i want to use jdk 8 and that's why 
I'm keeping the tag as yeah, open JDK colon eight hyphen JDK slim. So this is what my base image is. In that, what I want to do, I want when I will be building my application, what I will get, I'll get a jar out of it, right? So once I get the jar, I want to put that jar inside my this image. So that is what we are doing at line number three. Copy target slash demo, whatever that is my jar name. And I want to copy inside my uh, image and at which point so inside image it will copy it in at path slash app slash okay and the, my jar name in that will be demo dot jar okay i'm just stripping off some part so it, it's up to you what do you really want to call that image that you want to copy oh, sorry what do you want to call your jar inside the image you can keep it whatever name you want to then the uh, work directory is simply like a cd command i mean change directory so that your app container when it starts it will make sure that uh, it will start within that container uh, sorry that folder and this command is very important over here see all this while we have been talking about the fact that container runs but what do we mean by container runs uh you can direct it with the jar uh those who have built with uh, uh for the from the c programming perspective what happens when you run your c program uh it will start with a specific location which is the main method when you run your java application it starts with the main method when you run your jar it expects you either to give you the you have to tell it which is my main class or it will expect you to have a manifest file within your jar which will tell it where is the main class and it will start from the main method within it exactly in the same way your container when it starts it needs to understand what it really wants to run and that command is something that you provide over here so your image will run with the command that you provide under against this particular statement so over here, I want to run my Java application, right? Because when I'm shipping my Java uh, package, I want them to run my uh, Java application. So that's where I'm saying that Java minus jar. And because I'm keeping myself inside the app directory uh, as the line number four, I simply need to tell it the name of the jar, which is going to be demo.jar. So when my application or my container will start, it will run with this particular jar name, uh, demo.jar and uh, expose 8080 is simply uh, like a hint it is it does not really go and do anything very special it is a hint for anybody who reads this docker file that my application is uh, is exposing a uh, port 8080 as a part of this uh, runtime so uh, when i really go and have this file being defined this is simply a definition of the file okay it is not an image file it is a docker file which will help us to build the image now let's quickly go and uh, figure out how can I really build my image. But before I build my image, I have to build my application, right? Because to build my image, I need to have what? I need to have my demo snapshot jar. So for that, we will first build my application. And um, we are using Maven over here. That's why I'm do we are doing Maven clean install. But if you are using, let's say, a very plain vanilla style of building the Java application and all, you might actually go into your my Eclipse editor and uh, you might say export as a jar and you will get a jar out of it right so once you get your jar over here we are getting jar in the target folder you see that a jar file is ready for us now this is the time where we can uh, start building our application let's clear the log and yes now docker build that is the command that i really fired to build my container uh, sorry image now every image needs to have some name right uh, just like mysql had a name mysql and then it had some tag 8.0.21 same way my application i want to give my uh, docker image some name let's i will give it as a name as a demo uh, demo v1 v1 is my tag name uh, kalpesh can we go to the uh, command line once and uh, show them the currently available images which are there on my local machine so let's go docker images docker images gives me list of all the images that might have got pulled by docker because it was trying to run it so uh, by far i have tried to run different different uh, pack uh, images on my machine and those lists are come, uh, comes over here see this will start occupying some space on your host machine okay uh, but you can delete them as well as and when you don't really need them you can simply remove them but that's not what our focus is at this point of time but you see there is no image with the name of demo over here now let's build it so minus t is the name uh, mechanism by which we give it a name and a tag and then we have to tell it where uh, where is my context because uh, if you see i have we have commands like copy target something 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 and it will not be able to it will copy it will find out those folders only from that context so all the path that you want to refer as a part of your uh, docker build process where you want to copy something from your host machine into your image 
uh, you have to make sure that you are keeping your context over here we are going and doing it in that way where uh, i am at that location itself where i have my doc, uh, jar file built so uh, 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 one layer above in fact so my docker file is at the same place where i am firing my docker build command and that's why i don't really have to specify where my docker file is because docker by default implies that it is at the uh, local uh, sorry at the present working directory itself and uh, let's try to fire this command this will start building my application it will uh, it will package all these things and eventually it will create one image file and keep it inside my uh, machine's uh, image listing so if we if we see we have got successfully our docker images and we see that now uh, we have got doc demo image with the tag as v1 it was created like 12 seconds ago and its size is 300 mb why it is 300 mb my jar file is so small but it is it is also getting the operating system it's also getting open jdk inside it and also keeping my jar inside it and that's why it has come to 300 mb 300 mb but this is good right i mean in this way i am now confident if i ship this to roshan if he has docker he will definitely be able to go and run this application seamlessly regardless whether he has jdk on his machine or not and uh, let's try to run this application on the system because we want to make sure that uh, it is actually running as expected so we will run it with the name demo app as a container i have my application running on port 8080 but on my runtime i want to expose it as a 1990 on my host machine and uh, i want to run demo one with the tag as v1 let's try to hit it it has started running let's confirm whether it is indeed running or not we can go to the browser and uh, we can uh, yeah we can actually see it in the docker ps as well we see that it is running apart from that my mysql is still running you see we are running two applications at the same time in short two containers at the same time uh, and uh, both of them are running happily let let's go to the browser and confirm whether my application which is listening on port 8080 inside the container but exposed as port 1990 from outside and we have our shiny container running as expected and uh, it's quite sweet thanks to docker but is it good mm, maybe yes but is it good enough uh, for that i would say answer is maybe not and why that i mean am i greedy i would say for sure not but why i'm still saying it is not good enough Mm, maybe I'll hand over to Roshan to help us understand why it is still not good enough. Thank you. Thanks, Kalpesh. Yagnesh and uh, Kalpesh, thank you for this uh, this demo. Um, I think the world of containers and uh, Docker is an ocean onto itself. Uh, it's amazing that you were able to cram in a quick demo for us in this uh, kind of short time. So building on Ignatius' thoughts, and this is where uh, we kind of start to come to the close of the session today, uh, is, is, it, is it really sufficient for me to just be able to run one or a few containers uh, by hand, right? what you just saw in the demo today? Uh, the answer to that clearly is a no. Um, you need the ability to be able to monitor their health. You need the ability to be able to spawn more of them when you need, based on the traffic, um, be able to... Um, also um, scale up and down adaptively you know based on the traffic so that is where the idea of uh, something like a kubernetes comes into the picture right what we talked about as the container orchestrator comes into the picture uh, at that point uh, i think uh, kubernetes and look deep deep diving into container orchestration is a is again a vast space by itself uh, we would probably love to plan a follow-up session where we could play around with some of these tools a little bit more. Um, I think uh, in closing, just two other quick thoughts. Um, many people think that containers are like mini VMs. Um, I personally feel that a better description of that is a container is a better process abstraction than, than kind of thinking about it from a VM lens. Uh, the other thought is, um, and we probably missed this earlier in the conversation, is um, the multiple containers that you saw running uh, in, in the demo just now, they do share the same underlying kernel. Right? So we do not have multiple operating systems running there or different kernel instances running there. They are sharing the same kernel, which means while you do get a degree of isolation, uh, 
um, it is still a somewhat weaker isolation than what a pure like a type one hypervisor or a hypervisor with multiple operating systems will give you. So just something to put things in context. Uh, here. I think we are nearly uh, on the clock. Uh, I'd like to uh, maybe pass uh, pass it back to Ria to see if uh, she has any questions stacked up for us. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was such an insightful session for all of us. Yeah, we do have two to three questions. I'll just read them out. Question from Mukesh Kumar. Is there any difference between cloud enabled and a cloud native application? So uh, yes, so there are there are tiers by which one can define the cloud maturity of uh, you know of of a team or what the team is kind of building in the cloud. Um, a cloud native being sort of one of the higher ends of that spectrum or tier. Uh, I mean, one could say that hey, can I take my existing application and just move it to the cloud? Right? Does that mean it's cloud native? Uh, no, it is not. Um, you know, there are some of these facets that we talked about, right, in terms of being able to independently deploy components, in being able to have self-healing capabilities, uh, in being able to have the right kind of loose coupling between them. So companies, you'd find that companies like, say, Pivotal, VMware have defined this maturity curves for what it means for applications to go, um, you know, into the cloud. So, yeah, they're not the, they're not the same thing. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, there's one more question. Do we have any alternative for Docker? So Docker is only one of the containerization engines uh, uh, that's available in the market. Uh, there are uh, other container technologies like, uh, you know, Linux has uh, LXE or we have uh, RKT. Uh, but more or less, um, I think Docker has been, at least in the last few years, been more prevalent as a container engine. Uh, that's not to say that others are undermined. I think uh, some of the other container engines are also quite, um, I mean, investing quite a bit in, in the maturity of the platform. So. Okay, sir. Uh, there are no more questions. Uh, I guess everyone understood it very nicely. Now I take towards the end of the session. I thank you, sir, for your time and effort. And I thank every participant of every attendee to attend this session who are given his time. And we look forward for more such of sessions being tuned with us. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Th thank you, everyone. Yeah. Take care.